Whoa, 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 wait, stop. Before you do that, you need to know the truth. I'm about to destroy five myths about worms that even experienced gardeners believe. And honestly, one of these myths could actually be killing your worm population right now without you even knowing it. Hey, I'm Sunny from Sunnyside Soil, and on this channel, we dig deep, literally, into the science of healthy soil. And today, we're talking about the most misunderstood creatures in your garden, the earthworms. Now, I've been composting and vermicomposting for a number of years now, and the amount of bad information out there about worms is, it's honestly wild. These myths get repeated so often that they become common knowledge. But common knowledge isn't always correct knowledge. So today, we're putting five of the biggest worm myths under the microscope. Some of these are harmless misconceptions, but others, well, they could be seriously hurting your composting success or your garden ecosystem. And stick around to the end because myth number five is the one that surprised me the most when I learned the truth. Myth number one, if you cut a worm in half, you get two worms. Now, show of hands, or actually drop a comment if you believe this one, because I'm pretty sure we all heard this as kids, right? Some kid on the playground definitely told you this, and it sounds almost logical. Worms regenerate, so two worms, right? Wrong, so wrong. Here's what actually happens. At best, depending on where you cut, the head end of the worm might survive and regenerate a new tail, might. The tail end, dead. No brain, no mouth, there's no chance. But here's the thing, even the head section surviving is a big if. It all depends on what kind of species the worm is, where exactly you cut, whether infection sets in, and how much energy that worm has to heal. Most of the time, you just kill the worm. That's it, you murdered poor Bob the earthworm. Hope you're happy. But seriously, where does this myth come from? Well, worms can regenerate to some degree. Some species, like certain types of flatworms and planarians, which are not earthworms, by the way, can regenerate into two complete organisms. That's real. But earthworms, the ones in your garden and compost bin, no. There's actually a species called the Asian jumping worm. It's an invasive species here in North America. It's not one that, that you actually want. They can regenerate more effectively than most earthworms, but even they can't create two worms from one cut. So the bottom line, please don't cut your worms to multiply them. You're not helping, you're just creating a worm tragedy. There are much better ways to increase your population, which actually brings me to our next myth. Myth number two, worms double in population every 90 days. Oh, this one. This one is all over composting websites, worm farming guides, even some books. People out there are doing math, calculating like, if I start with a thousand worms, in one year I'll have 16,000 worms. And then they're disappointed when that doesn't quite happen. So is there any truth to this? Well, yeah, actually there kind of is. But also, no, there's not. Let me explain. Under perfect conditions, and I mean perfect, Ideal temperature, I like to raise my worms at about 65 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Perfect moisture, abundant food, perfect bedding, no stress, no predators. Red wiggler worms, also known as Asenia fetida, which are the most common composting worms, can reproduce pretty quickly. Each worm is a hermaphrodite, meaning that they have both male and female parts, but they still need to mate with another worm. After mating, they produce a cocoon, it kind of looks like a tiny lemon. And that cocoon can contain anywhere from one to 20 baby worms, but it's usually more like two to four worms. Those babies take about 60 to 90 days to reach maturity, depending on conditions. So technically, in perfect math land, you could see significant population growth in 90 day cycles. So this myth is only actually partially true because you can more than double your population if you have the right conditions. In my circumstance, I put about 500 worms in a breeding bin. I check that breeding bin almost every day, and in about eight weeks, I'll have about 3,000 worms. So yeah, you can more than double your worm population if 
under the right conditions. But, and this is a big but, those have to be perfect conditions. Here's what actually affects worm populations. The temperature, is it too hot or too cold? Reproduction slows way down or stops entirely. The perfect breeding temperature I have found for my worm bins is between 65 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Food availability, is there enough food? Worms can stop reproducing and focus solely on survival. Space, and here's a really cool thing that I learned about worms. They self-regulate their population based on density. So if your bend is too crowded, they're gonna stop reproducing. Cocoon survival rate. Not every cocoon hatches and not every baby survives. So the real advice here, don't buy worms based on inflated population promises. Start with an appropriate amount for your bin size, usually one pound of worms per square foot of surface area, and let them establish naturally. They'll find their balance. So I guess this is only a partial myth. If you take care of your worm bin with the right temperature and moisture and food, they'll definitely more than double in 90 days. But if you just set it in the corner and forget about it every once a month, you're probably not gonna get double. Okay, so we're three myths in now, and if you're enjoying this reality check, then do me a favor and hit that like button. It really helps the algorithm show the video to more gardeners who need to hear the truth. And if you're not subscribed yet, hit that subscribe button because we do science-based gardening content like this every week. All right, myth number three is one myth that I actually believed for way too long. All worms are good for your garden. So we're taught from childhood, worms equal good. You see a worm, good garden. No worms, bad garden. And for the most part, yes, earthworms are incredible for soil health. They aerate, they mix organic matter, they create nutrient-rich castings, worm poop, basically, that plants love. But here's the thing that nobody talks about. Not all worms are created equal, and some worms can actually be harmful. I talked about it before, so enter the Asian jumping worm, also known as the Alabama jumper or crazy worm. These invasive worms are spreading across North America and they're genuinely problematic. Why? Because they consume organic matter so quickly that they strip the topsoil of the layer that native plants depend on. They change soil structures in ways that hurt native ecosystems. And their castings have a grainy texture like coffee grounds that doesn't hold moisture or nutrients very well. You can identify them because they thrash around wildly when disturbed, hence jumping worm and they have a smooth milky white or gray band called a clitellum that goes all the way around their body versus the raised satellite band on beneficial earthworms. If you find these in your garden, don't relocate them. Currently, they've been found in the Eastern and Midwestern United States. I'm here in Colorado, so fortunately we haven't seen them yet, but if you do find them, dispose of them immediately. Check with your local extension office about the proper ways to dispose of them. Now, before you go right in your hate comment, I will tell you that almost every species of worm in North America is an invasive species. Europeans brought over both the European nightcrawler and the red wiggler worm. But somehow, those species of earthworms seem to have integrated into our ecosystem a little more friendly than the Asian jumping worm. Myth number four, worms eat fresh food scraps. Okay, technically they can eat fresh food scraps, but here's the thing, they don't really want to. And if you're putting fresh scraps into your worm bin, expecting them to devour them immediately, you're gonna be disappointed and confused about why your bin isn't working. Here's what worms actually eat. Decomposed organic matter. They're eating the bacteria, fungi, and microorganisms that are breaking down your food scraps, plus the partially broken down food itself. Think of worms less like a garbage disposal and more like the cleanup crew that comes in after the demolition team has done their work. This is why experienced vermicomposters will tell you to pre-compost or age your scraps for a few days before adding them in. Conversely, you can bury food in the bedding so that it starts breaking down faster. You can freeze and thaw scraps first, which break down cell walls and speeds up decomposition. If you just throw fresh banana peels or raw vegetables on top of your worm bin, a few things can happen. The worms will ignore it until it starts decomposing. It might attract fruit flies or smell bad when it's breaking down. 
It could heat up your bin if too much fresh material is breaking down all at once. The better approach, layer in small amounts at a time, cover with bedding, and let the microbial action start before expecting the worms to go to town on it. I like to keep a small bucket where I pre-compost scraps just for a few days before adding them to the worm bin. That's a game changer. Your worms aren't picky eaters. They just need a little patience while mother nature prepares their meal. All right, final myth time. And this is the one that actually shocked me when I first learned it. Myth number five, worms breathe through their skin so they need to stay wet. Now, the first part of this is true. Worms do breathe through their skin. They don't have lungs. Oxygen diffuses directly through their moist skin into their bloodstream. That's all true. So staying moist is very important. That is correct. But here's where the myth gets dangerous. Too much moisture will actually drown your worms. I cannot tell you how many beginners I've seen absolutely drown their worm bins because they thought moist equals good. So more moist equals more good. No, that's wrong. Worms need their skin to be moist for gas exchange to work, but they also need oxygen. If their environment is waterlogged, there's no oxygen in the water for them to breathe. They'll literally suffocate. This is actually why you see worms on sidewalks after a heavy rain, because they are literally drowning in the soil. The waterlogged soil doesn't have enough oxygen, and they're trying to find a place where they can actually breathe. The perfect moisture level for a worm bin is kind of like a wrung out sponge. Damp, but if you squeeze it, only a drop or two of water should come out. Not dripping, not pulling at the bottom, not mud. If your bin is too wet and there's water pulling at the bottom, then you can add dry bedding like shredded cardboard or newspaper. You can stop adding food for just a little bit. You can make sure that you have adequate drainage and airflow. And if your bin is too dry, then you can lightly mist with a spray bottle. You can add moisture rich foods like melons or cucumbers, or you can make sure your lid isn't allowing too much evaporation. Finding that balance is key. Moist, yes, Waterlogged, death trap. And I'm gonna be honest with you here, this myth is responsible for more dead worm bins than probably anything else I see in beginner mistakes. All right, so there you have it. Five worm myths thoroughly debunked. To recap, cutting worms doesn't give you two worms, it gives you one dead worm. Worm populations don't automatically double every 90 days unless you are very diligent with your worms. Not all worms are beneficial. Watch out for invasive species. Worms prefer decomposed food, not fresh food scraps, and too much moisture will drown your worms. The more you understand about how much worms actually work, the more successful you'll be with composting, vermicomposting, and building healthy garden soil. These creatures are absolutely incredible, but we've got to respect what they actually need, not what myths tell us they need. And if you've learned something new here today, leave a comment and let me know which myth surprised you the most. And if you've got other worm questions, drop those too. Maybe we'll make a part two. Check the video I'll link here about setting up your first worm bin the right way. Thanks for watching Sunnyside Soil. Get out there, get your hands dirty, and remember, happy worms, happy soil, happy garden. See you on the next one.